Welcome and <clears throat> good day, everybody. I'm Richard Ponzio. I direct the Global Governance, Justice, and Security Program at the Stimson Center based here in Washington, DC. <clears throat> and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar discussion on From the Summit for Democracy to a League of Democracies, which is organized by our colleagues at the Coalition for a World Security Community of Demo uh, Democratic Nations. <clears throat> this uh, World Security Community, as it's commonly referred to, is a global organization advocating for the creation of a community of democratic nations to promote peace and security, defend human rights, and tackle other global challenges. I will uh, soon encourage our colleague Didier Jake Jacobs, one of our panelists, to tell you more about the organization's ideas. And you can also learn, learn more about this coalition through www.worldsecuritycommunity.org. And I also wanted to share that this webinar is being recorded. We'll be promoting it widely after today's discussion. As we're all too aware, democracy worldwide is facing multiple challenges from social media driven fake news and foreign interference in elections in many places to the weakening of a country's democratically elected legislature vis-a-vis -vis ever more powerful executive branches. Indeed, ever since 9-11, some two decades, ago, democracy and human rights have suffered repeated setbacks across the world, according to Freedom House and, of course, the work of countless scholars. At the same time, <clears throat> deep rifts have emerged in relation between the West and both Russia and China, with echoes of the Cold War, and prominent international affairs commentators opine frequently that Western democracies are declining in power and influence relative to China and other emerging countries. Meanwhile, look no further than the latest news on the Omicron variant that we're all experiencing just the last few days. And we can see how humanity continues to face the short-term crisis of COVID-19. And of course, the long-term quintessential global governance challenge of our time, climate change. Against this backdrop, several world leaders, including US President Joe Biden and NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg have recently voiced support for greater collaboration between the world's democracies. For some, the emphasis is on repairing and strengthening democracy internally. For others, the focus is on tightening the bonds among democracies in order to tackle global challenges such as health pandemics and climate change, but also more effectively engaging powerful autocratic countries such as Russia and China. In this webinar, we will explore these and related themes in connection with President Biden's upcoming Summit for Democracy, which will take place next month on the 9th and 10th of December, as well as with respect to the related idea of creating a permanent forum among the world's democracies to tackle global challenges. Before we jump in, I'll briefly introduce all five of our expert panelists before we hear from them individually on this topic. And then uh, we're gonna get the ball rolling by having me pose a specific question for each panelist, which will then, they'll have five minutes to respond. There's a chance for all of you in our audience to engage the panelists. Uh, we encourage and welcome you to use the Q&A function on Zoom, and we're also encouraging our fellow panelists to um, not only respond to questions from the audience, but to build on and, and respond to the points made by your fellow panelists. So let's turn to our very first panelist, um, Dr. Tiziana Stella, who is the Executive Director of the Strike Council, which is dedicated to caring forward the ideas of Clarence Strike, whose best-selling book, Union Now, advocated a union of democracies to combat fascism all the way back in 1939, start of World War II. This book arguably marked the beginning of the Atlantic movement. And Tiziana is a uh, historian of US foreign policy and intellectual thought, and is herself writing a book on the history of the union of democracy idea. So Tiziana, let me begin with a question to you without going through, of course, the full history of uniting democracies. Unfortunately, we wouldn't have time, but could you tell us uh, a bit about the, the cute few lessons or really key insights that point to the need for far stronger bonds between democracies for tackling global challenges today. Yes, thank you, Richard, for the introduction and thanks to the organizers. It is a very exciting time to be here to be starting all these proposals on how to unite the democracies and how to use uh, this union to, uh, as a strategy to maximize the impact of democracy in the world. This was, um, I'm gonna present here in the limited time that I have uh, uh, some ideas and frameworks that I think uh, can be useful then to further the discussion. Uh, this idea emerged 
more than 100 years ago. And uh, precisely for the same purpose that we're discussing today, how to maximize the impact and the chances of democracies in the world, how to strengthen democracy both internally and internationally. It was presented ahead of World War I when it was hoped that it could actually uh, be used to avoid the war. Uh, and then became a major idea and, in fact, the main alternative scenario for uh, post-war order and world organization, both in World War I and in World War II. In 1917 and in 1941, this was the prevalent option, the idea that had the most support uh, among the public intellectuals, also partly in the administration. And so it has a rich tradition um, and uh, a rich logic behind it. Um, it was part incorporated later in the Euro-Atlantic structures of integration, and but just partially, and uh, um, it is part of the DNA of the ideas that we are discussing today and the frameworks that we are trying to renew and upgrade. Um, uh, the basic idea since the very beginning was that democracies did have preponderance of power, but their power was not organized and that they were the main cause of global instability. So uh, one of the concepts was democracies should unite, they should organize their power, they should organize this power uh, permanently, but that was only part of the concept uh, that was uh, promoted throughout this period by in the different variants uh, by different uh, thinkers and uh, uh, public intellectuals. Uh, the other element of the proposal was that democracy should not be limited just uh, to a criteria for membership, but as also, as also to become the method of the union and uh, the finality of the union, the finality for which this power was organized. And this was not just uh, an ethical preference, a moral preference, but it was very much based also on consideration of real politics. Uh, the idea was that democracy cannot thrive in an environment of international anarchy together with deep interdependence and uh, escalating violent capabilities that uh, the an environment that would be favorable for, to democracy would be instead one that would replace balance of power and power politics with internal sharing of power and external preponderance of power. And to create uh, these conditions, uh, it was important that uh, the union, uh, it, it became like a formal model at a certain point uh, to maximize uh, really the impact of democracy in the world. And in this formal model, uh, the ideal scenario would be that this union would be small enough so that it could have deep integration and therefore be able to actually bring in new members at the faster pace, which was important in the race against uh, 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 external chaos. It also um, had to be continuously have uh, uh, a situation of preponderance of power uh, so that uh, the logic behind that, it was that by doing that, it would possibly be, uh, mm, it, it was potentially possible to tilt um, uh, permanently the world toward uh, democracy. Um, And if you could kindly take no more than just another minute or so to yes, for the so intro. I guess I guess that one of probably the probably the other thing that I really want to stress is that this idea became uh, uh, very crucial in the interwar, where we had the um, the league actually in, ex in existence as a, a world organization and the incapability of the league to pre prevent the global security uh, and economic crisis. At the same time, we have the crisis of democracy. And so the two crises are interdependent. There is a backsliding of a democracy in the strong democracy. At the same time, there is the generation of the newer democracies into illiberal regimes. And uh, 
So this was seen actually uh, crucial to overcome uh, the dynamics that uh, were created by that uh, scenario. Um, and uh, I think I think that's all that I can say in the time that I, that I have at this point. Yeah. Thank you, Tatiana. I would, be glad, I would be glad to go back into more details later. Absolutely. Now, introducing the, the rich tradition of the idea. And of course, we'll be making linkages throughout today's discussion with next week's or, or next month's summit for uh, democracy. Uh, professor John Eikenberry <clears throat> is the Albert G. Milberg Professor of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University. Many of you in this forum will be familiar with his prolific career as a scholar defending the idea of liberal internationalism. 15 years ago, he co-authored <clears throat> a report of the bipartisan Princeton Project on National Security entitled Forging a World of Liberty Under Law, in which he advocated for a concert of democracies. So we're hearing many terms today, <clears throat> the Union of Democracies, League of Democracies, and now Concert of Democracies. In his most recent book, A World Safe for Democracy, he notes that in international liberalism is threatened from the outside by illiberal challengers and from the inside by nationalist populist movements. So John, building on uh, Tiziana's um, lead off remarks, what do you think is the right level of ambition for collaboration among democracies? What, what should it be actually and why? And on this topic, what role, if any, could pre President Biden's Summit for Democracy play? Thank you, Richard. It's great to be on this uh, distinguished panel. And, and uh, I, it's great to follow Tiziana because in some ways my, my uh, contribution is, is to offer kind of historical and theoretical arguments about the world of democracies and the project of cooperation. And indeed, we're here today uh, gathered together because for the last 200 years, liberal democracies have been searching for a way to, to build a world that makes them safe. Uh, from the very beginning, from the age of democratic revolutions, uh, liberal democracies have had an internationalist aspect to their project, to creating uh, what I would call a kind of environment or an ecosystem to, to protect them, to uh, facilitate cooperation, to to realize the gains that come from, from trade and openness, but also to protect from the, the, the world out there that is uh, full of tyranny, brutality, intolerance. So there is, as uh, Tiziana said, a, a kind of deep, deep uh, um, impulse within liberal democracy to create uh, uh, an environment or a geopolitical space for, for uh, uh, contending with, with the problems of modernity. And I think we're at that moment today where we're doing that again. And um, I guess what I would say more specifically to your, to your question, th that um, I would come down in favor of a kind of decentralized system, not so much a single unified union or federation, but to, to work to build across the global space lots of different coalitions and platforms for uh, liberal democracies to, to operate. Uh, I, I, I'm not a tactician and I'm not a, here to argue for one particular vision. I, I would prefer to, to make the case for uh, intensified uh, 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 cooperation among democracies in an, in an era where uh, a rising China is in some sense sharp, sharpening the, the stakes that are involved in liberal democracies, getting their act together, finding a basis for common cause. But I would say a couple of things. I think that the Biden administration gets it. I think they, they understand what the environment, what the kind of world historical moment is. Uh, think about Biden in his UN speech. He, he mentioned uh, partnerships uh, 16 times and alliances eight times in his, in, in his short speech. He was making the case that the United States and indeed uh, by implication, all the other democracies um, are, are in it together, that, that there is no way that one state, even the most powerful state in the, country, in the world, the United States, can single-handedly uh, protect and defend liberal democracy in a hostile world, that it has to be a, increasingly going forward a, a group project, uh, uh, creating a kind of critical mass uh, in this this world, I, I've already used a couple terms that I would 
emphasize. One is ecosystem, that, that we should think about liberal democracies trying to build a, a ecosystem that will allow them to balance their, their various interests and principles and norms and uh, work together to aggregate power and wealth. Um, and I use the term critical mass, that is to say in a world where alternatives to liberal democracy are creating their own internationalism, think of China, think of the authoritarian internationalism that, has, that is afoot today, that it pays for the liberal democracies to create a kind of critical mass to, re to drive reform agendas on international rules and institutions that increasingly in the 21st century, the competition with China and other countries is over platforms, protocols, regulations, and regimes for the management of problems, not least uh, emerging 21st century technologies. So finding a critical mass so that the countries that form the, the liberal democratic world have a, a kind of scale uh, uh, advantage that will allow other countries to, in some sense, be forced to come to them rather than the other way around. When China starts setting the, the norms and, and regime principles of the international system, we know that we, we, are, we, are, we are lost. So I would just end by saying, I, I would say there would need to be a kind of double, double uh, agenda. One is to, to build these platforms, often in very different spaces. In, because they are they are different issue areas, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, cyber, uh, trade. Uh, there's no one single coalition of democracies that can work in all of these different areas. Uh, so, uh, and, and indeed, it's better in some sense not to uh, to raise the the stakes so that it is a single kind of uh, Manichaean uh, us versus them world, but to build platforms that that create a, attractive. Uh, a, 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 attractions for other states to join. So those kind of platforms. Then secondly, a kind of D10, uh, and, and Ash might speak to this, but I think that there's a kind of role for a, a, a group of senior states that might uh, have as their writ the, 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 uh, the, the kind of surveillance of the world democratic situation, looking for gaps, looking for opportunities, for uh, countries to work together to strengthen uh, uh, rules and norms in particular areas. So I think both the, the global agenda of finding uh, um, areas for cooperation, and then secondly, I, I would put some money on, 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 this, uh, on this D10 uh, concept of, 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 of steering or of leadership. Just end by saying, I've written a book on a world safe for democracy, and and uh, uh, um, what the, one of the most striking things that I've found in looking back over 250 years of liberal democracies uh, uh, grappling with how to organize international order is that they have always felt, with good reason, that they are safer in a world where liberal democracies hold sway, and we live today in a world where China contests that world. And therein lies the geopolitical and grand strategic rub. And so with lots of different ideas uh, at our command, I would say we need to work across these different levels to find a way for the liberal democracies to continue to hold sway. I'll stop there. Thank you, John. Uh, as just shared, a model of decentralized uh, cooperation among democracies today uh, this could be seen as an alternative or complement to uh, the ideas shared by Tiziana, more of a union or a federation of democracies, which I'm sure will come further into our discussion today, especially when we hear from Didier in a few moments, as well as uh, uh, Mariam. Um, and, and also keep in mind uh, the, the words the, that John referred to uh, from President Biden's speech in September, partnership and alliances, we're surely going to see that uh, quite frequently throughout next week's uh, summit discussions. Uh, it's, it's a virtual summit, as people know. So uh, now we're going to hear from Ash Jain, who is director of the Democratic uh, Order Program with the Scowcross Center for Strategy and Security at the Atlantic Council. Um, there he oversees the Democratic Order Initiative. And as uh, John Eikenberry just referred to, 
the D10 strategy for him. He's a leading proponent of the idea of a D10, an enlarged version of the G7, to also include democracies in the Indo-Pacific region. In practice, uh, we've seen just in this past year, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson attempting to take forward uh, the D10 uh, concept, inviting Australia, South Korea, and India, as well as uh, South Africa, so I guess D11, to the G7 earlier this year. So Ash, could you tell us uh, what is the current state of play of your D10 initiative, as well as its potential, if any, to next month's summit to, for democracy? And I also understand you're working on an alliance of democracies concept. Please share a little bit of, on that as well. Well, thank you, Richard. And it's great to, to be here with you um, to discuss these questions. Uh, let me answer your, your question first by talking a little bit about why there is such a need uh, for closer cooperation among democracies today. Uh, this is a topic uh, that is at the heart of the initiative that I'm leading at the Atlantic Council, the Democratic Order Initiative, uh, and we've been looking into these questions very closely. Um, so as, as John mentioned, the, the world is entering an era of uh, strategic competition. For the first time in, in more than three decades, the U.S. and its allies are facing a systemic challenge from autocratic rivals. Uh, and as President Biden has noted on many occasions, the world is at an inflection point between democracy and autocracy. This includes China, which is growing more powerful, and Russia uh, as aut an autocratic power that is more assertive as they engage in coercive tactics to expand their influence around the world. Uh, at the same time, the democracy is on the defensive, uh, dealing with internal challenges and trying to counter with, with disinformation, cyber attacks, uh, election meddling, um, and you name it. So to position themselves to succeed in this new era, the, U the United States and its democratic allies do need to strengthen cooperation. They need new institutions, both formal and informal, um, and, and, and in order to confront today's challenges. One option is, as you mentioned, Richard, that we have looked at is the idea of forging a D10, a Democracies 10 that would bring together leading democracies, uh, including the United States and Canada, uh, and its allies in Europe, as well as the Asia Pacific. Uh, the D10 would particularly reflect the increasing importance of Indo-Pacific powers uh, by ensuring that Australia and South Korea, and perhaps India, are brought to the table, uh, which currently focuses on the G7. We described this in a new Atlantic, or in an Atlantic Council report that we released over the summer that, uh, that lays a framework for creating a D10 to work out a common strategic agenda on shared challenges, uh, including those posed by China and Russia. Uh, that initiative got a jump start when Boris Johnson tried to convene a D10 um, and, and formalize it in some way uh, as an expanded G7, but it did run into some pushback uh, from some of the other members of the G7. And so at the moment, uh, the, the initiative still is out there as a potential framework for cooperation in the future. Uh, the G7 remains as the platform, the current platform for engaging democratic partners um, on at least a subset of global challenges. So in addition to the D10, we, we, we've also proposed to create a new alliance of democracies, uh, which could provide another key platform to engage a broader group of democratic allies and partners uh, around the world. Such an alliance would be political, uh, not military. It would be aimed at forging common threat assessments and coordinating strategies among democracies to position the free world for success in this growing strategic competition. Uh, what would such an alliance do? Uh, we would contend that it should focus on three defining challenges facing the free world. Uh, the first is systemic competition with autocratic powers, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, that the alliance can foster more coordination uh, to, to deal with the assertive actions by China and Russia to undermine democracy. For example, coordinated sanctions with larger numbers uh, of uh, allies and partners uh, against autocratic regimes. It could also help foster efforts to make democracies less vulnerable to economic coercion. Uh, for example, facilitating supply chains uh, away from autocratic states uh, when it comes to sensitive technologies and critical energy uh, supplies. The second area it could focus on is democratic backsliding. Uh, the alliance can help hold states accountable for their own democratic practices at home and facilitate uh, best practices among democracies to deal with challenges 
um, that, that all of our democracies are contending with. And finally, the alliance could serve as a platform to address uh, disruptive technologies. Now, as John mentioned earlier, this is a key issue and we, we need a framework where allies can come together and forge common standards to, to address advanced technologies that are consistent with liberal norms and values. It also could ensure that democracies prevail uh, over China and others in the race to develop advanced technologies. Um, so President Biden's Summit for Democracy offers a, a, a window of opportunity uh, to bring such an alliance to life. Both the D10 and an alliance of democracies could be mutually reinforcing platforms to advance democratic cooperation. And I look forward to talking more about practical ways uh, that these kinds of initiatives could be brought to fruition. Thank you so much, Ash, especially keeping the time and uh, really glad you brought up the uh, Alliance of Democracy, something our colleague Miriam is gonna speak about now, but just to highlight the three key points, you emphasized uh, that it would deal with systemic competition with autocratic countries, uh, democratic backsliding and disruptive technologies. So over to Miriam, uh, she, uh, I better try to pronounce your last name, Chikla Zade uh, in, in the uh, country of Georgia, please, correct me when you introduce yourself, Mariam, who is a researcher and election integrity fellow at the Alliance of Democracies Foundation. This foundation was established in 2017 by Anders Fogh Rasmussen, a well-known former prime minister of Denmark and former secretary general of NATO. So Mariam, then building directly on uh, Ash's overview, could you tell us um, more about your foundation and its work to advance the idea of, alliance, of an alliance of democracies and I'd love for you to also share your hopes for uh, next week's Summit for Democracies in connection with your Alliance initiative. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Uh, greetings from Tbilisi, Georgia. I'm deeply honored to be the part of this uh, distinguished panel um, with the uh, world's foremost minds who think uh, about and write a lot about um, uh, global affairs and future of democracy. Uh, being part of the Alliance of Democracies Foundation, where we also research and uh, discuss the future of uh, democratic uh, coalition, I might have something to add to uh, this discussion. And uh, mostly I will, um, expand and build on Ash's points about the challenges we face and how uh, the Alliance of Democracies Foundation has um, figured out some of the specific suggestions to address uh, those challenges. Let me articulate uh, the problems and the way we see it uh, first. Uh, obviously, the number one is um, uh, multiple times mentioned um, rising authoritarianism and uh, China and Russia uh, specifically. Uh, uh, they are uh, increasingly aggressive um, um, efforts to challenge uh, the democratic and the liberal uh, world order and um, rule, rules based order, I would uh, say. Uh, both of them uh, use uh, multiple techniques and economic coercive tools, uh, uh, including uh, them, uh, but not only economic. And here comes the technology, which we, which we also have mentioned um, uh, previously. This technology technology which is uh, super rapidly uh, developing real uh, and uh, has the potential to significantly um, uh, define the geopolitics uh, currently. Uh, and this uh, technology is in the hands of um, autocracies and authoritarian regimes becomes disruptive technologies and they g actually give them uh, the upper hand. Um, the third I would say um, is um, uh, also something uh, you, um, Freedom House has been warning us uh, for the couple of years that a democracy in all parts of the world is uh, declining and uh, the trust towards um, democratic uh, norms, processes such as elections uh, namely, um, and um, uh, institutions are uh, declining unfortunately and, um, and the uh, playground is uh, um, uh, gradually in more countries 
not only in premature premature democracies but also in established ones are uh, taken by um, populist illiberal uh, leaders uh, that's also something um, at AOD we are disturbed with uh, so what are the what what uh, we should do to overcome these challenges and to tackle those uh, right is there a single power who would uh, which one uh, would uh, single-handedly do this and uh, obviously um, unfortunately or fortunately there is not and here comes the need for um, unity and coordinated pushback against um, uh, autocracies um, and also there is a, uh, at, at a AOD we also um, think that there is a need for a platform where a member uh, a democracy uh, after being coerced could turn to and uh, urge for um, uh, concerted uh, response uh, in case of a coercion or in case of a um, significant uh, violation of a rule-based order. So uh, to contribute to that uh, forward-looking um, agenda and discussion, uh, the um, Alliance of Democracies Foundation uh, launched the Charter of Democracies, Charter of Copenhagen Charter for the Alliance of Democracies, um, that's the full name, um, which has uh, three major pillars addressing this three major challenges uh, I have uh, laid out. Um, the specific suggestion here is, uh, for example, economic article five, um, inspired by NATO article five. Um, uh, and uh, this is an attempt to uh, foster uh, effort to make uh, democracies um, coordinate economically, more cooperate with each other so that they could um, uh, counterbalance uh, the uh, cooperation which happens and the economical ties and coercion which happens on the side of autocracies and also uh, to um, not to leave uh, countries vulnerable against coercion perpetrators. Uh, such um, uh, measures would be a democratic economic preference zones or alternative roads um, circumventing um, uh, autocratic powers and um, others. Um, I guess the uh, idea is that if uh, Taiwan gets uh, pressured by China or Georgia by Russia, they are not uh, left alone and vulnerable. Um, and there is a support system um, uh, there. The second, uh, I would, um, uh, I think I would define it as the second um, component of the charter, uh, somewhat the same way. There is a need of um, the tech democracies to come together and address the technology uh, and the disruptive technology issue um, so that they create some future of uh, internet and future of democracy, a uh, future of technology um, forum um, uh, and to address this uh, lack of cooperation in this uh, realm. And the third and probably the last point uh, at this uh, um, uh, point is uh, to uh, create the support system also for uh, democracies and especially frontline democracies and we know they uh, are um, in um, um, in anywhere uh, in any parts of the world I would name uh, Ukraine I would name Belarus um, Myanmar and other countries uh, so uh, to um, stand uh, up for them and to stand up for those who fight for democracy in the streets and not only in the streets um, that's uh, that's crucial so that um, um, so for example, uh, we uh, at the Alliance of uh, this is one of the biggest in initiatives of the Alliance of Democracies Foundation, which uh, tries to curb the influence of um, and the uh, reach of um, election interference. This is Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity, uh, but uh, that's uh, not the uh, um, election interference and uh, disinformation, which uh, primarily uh, makes um, frontline democ democracies vulnerable. Um, is not the only tool uh, in the hands of um, in the hands of autocracies, and they uh, definitely um, use um, other technological tools too uh, to suppress and uh, um, uh, and disrupt um, frontline democracies. So that's also one of the aspects I would uh, approach this um, idea to. Thank you. Mary. And uh, yeah, very last um, uh, very last uh, ideas uh, to just to sum up all those. Um, uh, I think that uh, probably 
of those I have mentioned open more questions rather than answers them, but uh, it's supposed to be complicated. It's a global affair. So uh, I think what we should uh, uh, agree on is that when there is a big problem, the only way is uh, the only way out would be to create the solution bigger than that problem. So I think there is a momentum for that. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Miriam. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, building on Ash's points about the Alliance for Democracies, because I see a lot of similarities with how uh, Professor Eikenberry introduced the idea of a decentralized system of collaboration, he used the words platform, support system. And this is uh, in some ways juxtaposed again, uh, the stronger, deeper uh, collaboration inherent in a union or in the title of today's event, the league. And uh, we're about to hear from Didier Jacobs on a, a coalition uh, among uh, democracies in a, a world security community. Um, this coalition is, as you know, uh, the co-sponsor, uh, main sponsor of today's event. And Didier is the vice president of the coalition, which is a global organization advocating for the creation of a community of democratic nations to promote peace and security, defend human rights, and tackle other global challenges. Uh, I see many questions in the Q&A box after Didier. We're going to be taking those questions. We welcome a few more. But first, for Didier to tell us a little bit more about the uh, coalition, what it stands for, and um, uh, maybe, you know, the genesis for today's program and your own uh, thoughts on, on today's themes. Thank you. Yes, thanks, uh, Richard, for this introduction and greetings to all listeners. So our group, the Coalition for a World Security Community, was created in 2018 uh, through the New Shape Prize of the Global Challenges Foundation. And the question that we tackled at that time was what global governance innovation is needed to reduce the risk of catastrophic war. And our response was a world security community of democratic nations. So of course we have the United Nations, which has both the duty and, and the right to uh, protect all its members from aggression and all UN members are supposed to lend military forces to enforce UN decisions. However, as we know, the United Nations is very indecisive and in practice, every country uh, is left to fend for themselves to protect their security. Uh, we believe that a, a more realistic approach, I mean, obviously we'd like the United Nations to shape up uh, and that's the plan A, but the, the plan B, uh, a more realistic approach is for uh, the rich democracies to incrementally expand uh, their umbrella of security to other countries. Unlike most countries in the world, the rich democracies are uh, protected from uh, with each other. They, they are hanging together through NATO and bilateral treaties. Uh, they are very powerful and hence they feel fairly safe. So while we cannot just wish away the distrust that exists uh, within the United Nations Security Council, um, we could, the, the rich democracies could at least extend their very safe security umbrella to other democracies that presumably they trust more. Um, so that, that's the basic idea of our group. Uh, we could start with, uh, as I said, there is a uh, NATO, uh, there is all the bilateral treaties that the US has with Asian countries. Secretary Blinken himself noted that uh, it's kind of strange that the United States has these European allies, the Asian allies, but the two are not working together, which is a missed opportunity. Let's have a, a multilateral defense treaty uh, putting all these allies together. And then let's open that treaty to other countries that, that we trust, uh, democracies, whether from Latin America or other countries. And to make sure that this trust remains, I think it's important to have a clear and, and somewhat stringent uh, membership criteria to ensure that uh, all countries abide by international law and respect human rights and, and democracy. And that would follow the European Union model that has been very successful at uh, encouraging uh, democratization in Europe as the prospect of joining the European Union was a powerful incentive for countries like Spain and Greece to democratize. Um, so at the same time, we do not want this world security community to undermine the United Nations. Uh, we believe that uh, it should be refocused really on defense 
uh, protecting its own members and intervene outside of its borders only with the approval of the UN Security Council, which does mean continuing working with China and Russia on other countries, as difficult as that may be. And that does mean that there is going to be uh, ongoing instability in the rest of the world. Uh, nevertheless, this world security community would be an island of uh, stability and security in this turbulent world. And uh, hopefully it would uh, incrementally grow over time with more and more countries becoming democratic. Uh, and at the same time, it would not be uh, threatening to countries at the outside. So that's in, in the nutshell our, our response to, to the Global Challenges Foundation uh, to reduce the risk of catastrophic wars. Rich democracies first should stop starting wars and second they should extend their security, security umbrella to countries that they do trust and that's to other democracies. Now, uh, just a few more words about the, the coming summit. Uh, obviously, our starting point has been security, and security is the heart of international affairs. Hard power is the heart of international affairs. That's very important. Uh, but obviously, a community of democracies could uh, be helpful in many other areas, like those of the, the summit, protecting human rights, fighting corruption, um, and uh, uh, confronting authoritarianism. Uh, for this summit, we, we hope uh, that first it will not be a one-off or a two-off. I guess the, the plan is to uh, have countries make some commitment this year and then meet again next year to check progress on these commitments. But obviously, uh, fighting corruptions uh, and, and all these issues will not be resolved in a year. So we, we hope this summit will be uh, permanent. Um, and then it can start to be uh, the the nexus of, of what uh, Professor Eikenberry called the this, uh, ecology of institutions. And we very much hope that beyond unilateral commitment, it will develop some norms on a range of issues like election integrity, and that it will foster uh, and rely on other, including existing organizations like NATO and the OECD, uh, that are already uh, intergovernmental organizations of democracies that should themselves expand their membership to other democracies. And so if we have uh, this annual summit of leaders, then technical work done by NATO and the OECD, uh, and then expansion of these countries, we start to have this kind of uh, ecology that uh, Professor, Professor Eikenberry was uh, talking about. Um, and obviously, the, I, I'll, I'll just finish uh, by referring to something that uh, Tiziana said at the beginning, that the, uh, the idea of uh, an alliance or a community of democracy, it's not so much, it's both to uh, promote democracy internally, but also the method of the community itself should be democratic. And that is something we also strongly believe in. I, we don't think that the, a large community with many countries would function without democratic accountability and decision-making systems. And so that is something that uh, should be developed uh, over time as well. So that is the, the overview of what we, we stand for and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Didier. And uh, thank you once again for um, taking the initiative with your colleagues and organizing today's very rich discussion. We have a whole bunch of questions to address over these next 15, 20 minutes or so, maybe we could run a few minutes over. And let's jump in. I'm gonna uh, pose a question or two, in some cases, to each of our five panelists. Kindly take uh, no more than two or so minutes in uh, responding if you can, and uh, feel free to build off of each other's uh, points. Um, Professor uh, Eikenberry, the first question is addressed to the academic community and uh, thoughts, your thoughts on prioritizing education for democracy and launching a global initiative to support citizens making democracy work better. What, what can academics do uh, to help citizens uh, function better in democratic uh, societies? <clears throat> but I also want you to pick up on the second question about the whole issue of backsliding, something important, I think, to the uh, uh, Alliance for Democracy's concept in a country like Bangladesh, uh, uh, which is, um, in need of restoring democracy and human rights as proposed by Mr. Mohammed Haq, one of our uh, questioners. Next, we'll hear, hear from uh, Tiziana on the question from Chris Hammer 
let me let me read that after we hear uh, Professor um, Eikenberry's response. But you'll see in the Q and A function to the other panelists questions addressed to each of you that I'll be posing. Professor Eikenberry. Well, I I'm always a little nervous when we are asking universities to to do things that are are, are specifically directed at, uh, at at world politics. I think what universities can do is educate people and to reaffirm our commitment to enlightenment principles of reason, discussion, of knowledge, of respect for science. Uh, universities have a huge role to play, uh, educating the next generation, illuminating the problems that the world face, faces. Uh, and I, I think in various ways, incubating um, uh, conversations uh, that sp spill, spill out of universities into the into the larger global civil society. A lot of what we're talking about today is about global civil society, finding networks and uh, points of, of light and, and points of strength for groups and civil societies working with uh, uh, governments to strengthen democratic institutions in countries like Bangladesh, where, where all the help is needed. And I, I think this kind of uh, long-term effort at working the problem in all these different levels, uh, alliances of democracy, yes, government, uh, intergovernmental cooperation like the G7, the D10, yes, and, and then these larger diffuse uh, institutions that support uh, uh, voter, uh, voter rights and uh, election, fair elections. Uh, so, so I think my idea of, of an ecology, of an ecosystem, where a lot of different kinds of people doing lots of different things, creating an overall environment, is where I would, where I would, would, would emphasize the importance of, of what we're doing today. Thank you, uh, John. Um, Tiziana, from our colleague Chris Hammer, also from this coalition organizing today's program, I believe you are presently advocating a full-scale federation of democracies can you tell us a bit more about that? And what do you think, or how, and do you think we can get there in one leap, a big bang approach, or would it have to be uh, pro pro proceeding in various stages? Oh, well, you're on mute. Okay. No, obviously I'm not proposing right now a federation of democracies, and obviously I'm not proposing that we can get there in one leap. I just think that this, uh, as a model, as a formal model, and the dynamics that, that uh, it um, shows is very important as to keep it in mind as we envision ways uh, to improve the impact of democracy in the world. So the idea that could be the final stage, of course, but it's just by looking at what the dynamic of federation can do in the relations among democracies inside and also outside and how that can help uh, um, guide a little bit the discussion of where we're going like as a target so in terms of what policies we are choosing and what um strategies we're using um yeah that's that's my answer thank you and turning to and miriam I, we sorry one, one more thing Please, I, I do agree with Professor I can vary that, of course, there should be different platform. It can be decentralized. Uh, there can be functional uh, areas where there is overlapping and there is also concentric circles. Uh, the outer level can be uh, the level of the UN where the universality is a true certainty, but it doesn't necessarily be so uh, at all the other levels, uh, there are other ways to reach universality through democracy. And so the two things can actually work together. Great, now I think we're starting to see a convergence, uh, a building block approach, uh, with the Alliance for Democracies in mind, which is what I wanna turn to with Miriam. We're gonna come to the D10 questions uh, for Ash in a minute, but uh, Miriam, uh, the uh, question from John Ta Davenport, and there's another related question I'll mention, I'm all dealing with China. He, he writes, we should be willing to consider different kinds of alliances or coalitions, each with different nations as members. Maybe this will seem less threatening uh, to countries like uh, China. Um, although, you know, the, the fear is that they're going to construe uh, the formation of this alliance as a, a beginning of a new Cold War. 
And a related question <clears throat> by one of our colleagues was the, the critical problem at the moment is China's threat of military aggression against Taiwan. Could an alliance of democracies raise an effective stop sign against any such aggression? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, about um, China and um, partnership of uh, democracies um, uh, to deter it. Um, well, I uh, wanted to uh, stress on the point that uh, mostly uh, what uh, that, that comes down to the question of um, the membership uh, pretty few, frequently. And that's one of the prevalent um, questions asked um, and discussed in, in this topic. So like uh, if you exclude, do you ex include China or and Russia or other uh, autocracies or you exclude them both uh, it has a uh, pros and cons if you exclude them of course you risk uh, further antagonizing uh, china and uh, it's uh, quite um, logical to think forward about this uh, but uh, should it should it deter us to uh, unite uh, i think not because the biggest problem solving potential lies in uh, democracies rule based um, game and the unity of democracies because together it's uh, stronger it's a group exercise uh, i would say uh, because uh, single-handedly as we have already uh, many times uh, stressed on it is not uh, as easy to counter so together it's uh, more plausible uh, and also um, about the um, uh, second question I would um, uh, add that um, no second part of the question I'm not touching Taiwan yet uh, also um, I think, I think that um, you know, economic cooperation and creating pre preferable uh, economic um, um, frameworks to trade, uh, lowering trade barriers, uh, lowering tariffs be between each other um, will uh, make other countries also willing to join this um, uh, alliance. So that's one of the ways also to counterbalance those who are uh, rushing forward with uh, coercive uh, methods. Um, um, and uh, I think that's uh, one of the ways to deter um, also the military um, expansion or aggression of an autocratic regime over the um, um, over the vulnerable uh, country um, uh, under the question, like namely uh, Taiwan. So many multiple uh, tools uh, of deterrence should be um, uh, united uh, to uh, achieve this. Um, um, situation when you uh, don't let this China and Russia uh, undermine uh, the liberal, liberal world order. Of course, uh, one, um, uh, one topic, unity will not be able to do that. There is multiple uh, approaches uh, needed to be uh, found. Great, and I welcome using the famous two finger sign uh, if any of our panelists <coughs> wish to jump in, build upon or uh, respond to a comment made by one of your fellow panelists. Um, turning to Ash, uh, there are three D10 related questions. Let me go through them all very quickly and, and they're all interconnected. The concern about a D10 is that it will include unstable and fragile democracies and countries that are increasingly autocratic, such as India at the top of the table, according to uh, the one uh, question post. Should one of the first tasks of those advocating for a league or D10 be to promote action to address backsliding rather than creating a club based on economic power. And then uh, the two other questions are very short ones. I'd like to hear more on Ash's take about which nations in the G7 objected to the D10 and why. And finally, uh, why should democracies of the global south wish to join a group dominated by rich countries like the, those being proposed in the D10 or D11? Ash. Yeah, good questions. Let me... Um take them on here. Uh, first, with uh, regard to the question posed about um, who's objecting to the D10 and why. Uh, this is from John Davenport. Uh, good to hear from him. Uh, so there, the concerns about expanding the G7 to a D10 basically stem around kind of two major concerns. One is, would it detract from the effectiveness that the G7 currently poses because it is relatively like-minded. It consists of like-minded powers uh, who at least share a history of cooperation and a kind of sense of maintaining cooperation on certain issues. If you start to expand that group, do you bring in others who might be less like-minded 
uh, when it comes to say dealing dealing with questions uh, and challenges uh, posed by Russia and China. Um, you know, is South Korea uh, going going to change that dynamic? Uh, would India, in the picture, change the way the G7 uh, tackles questions about Russia? Um, there are legitimate questions that have been raised about the impact of broadening the group. Uh, and then relatedly, um, there are others who are concerned about the optics of, of a D10 that expands to Asia Pacific powers and, and then starts to look like it's an alliance against China um, more than just a construct that brings together democracies. Uh, this, was, this relates to another question about polarization and would groups like this you know, polarize in the community, uh, the international community? Um, so that is another question that, that others uh, in the G7 have raised. Um, and I think because of those issues unresolved, uh, the, the, the D10 concept um, you know, sort of remains open. Um, in terms of addressing those questions, I think they apply both to the D10 as well as Alliance of Democracies concept. Would it polarize the international system? Uh, the reality is that the, the international system is already becoming polarized on its own. You know, it, it's now more a question of how do we, the democracies, react to that polarization? China and Russia are taking actions that are undermining democratic norms uh, and coercing, uh, using coercion against uh, democratic partners. Um, does the rest of the, the international community, does, do the democracies let this happen and try to deal with it individually, country by country, or do we somehow coalesce uh, to come up with a common approach to dealing with these challenges? Um, and that's what the D10 and, and an alliance of democracies would be about. It's not about trying to create a confrontation with these powers or to undermine cooperation in other venues. The UN will remain you know, a place to go for dealing with issues like nuclear proliferation and climate change and, and other global challenges, uh, pandemics, where there has to be cooperation with a lot of countries, uh, in, including China and Russia. So it doesn't replace that system. Uh, it layers that system with others where we can go when we can't get cooperation uh, through through that through that venue. Um, and then finally, with regard to just very quickly on the question of why why would countries like India and the Global South want to be part of the D10 or or part of an alliance of democracies? I think the answer is pretty clear. It, it, they share many of these countries are democracies. They share the same concerns. Uh, this gives them, them a platform for influence to shape decisions and policies. Um, and it allows for, uh, again, this kind of cohesive approach to dealing with challenges rather than going after them country by country. Um, there's more to say on these topics, uh, but I know we're out of time, uh, so I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Ash, and I wish to give the final word to Didier. Uh, it, but to build upon what I see as a central theme in today's discussion, maybe why I chose this outstanding uh, group of panelists, that uh, Didier, the, the D10 idea, could you see that the idea that Tiziana made earlier of a, a group of concentric circles, the Alliance for Democracies being even larger, of course, than the D10, and then on the way to the, your vision for a security community of democracies. Now, I got two other related questions. Just feel free to choose one or two of these questions to respond to in, in wrapping up today's discussion. But one of them by a colleague is that is a security community of democracies could be only the first step in a longer term process, building on these concentric circles, perhaps. Could you say a few words about where this process might lead in the future? And then finally, a, a wonderful question by John Vlasto, who's uh, the uh, chair of the uh, executive team for the World Federalist Movement, which has been around, as people know, since uh, World War II. Is there a risk that any organization of democracies will generate a non-democratic opposition and so hinder global cooperation on urgent challenges such as the climate crisis? So Didier, get the prerogative, choose uh, which of any of these you may wish to respond to. Yes, on, on the last one, I, I agree with what uh, Ash uh, has said and that there is unfortunately already a, a competition and uh, we need to organize it. Um, on the question of the, the larger vision, and first of all, I, I completely subscribe to this idea of a, an ecology. We, we are talking about one particular organization, which is a defense alliance. Uh, but it can be one element of other element in an ecosystem of uh, organizations that allow uh, democracies to collaborate. All of them, though, do face one challenge, and that's where the, the, the long-term vision, if we can uh, finish with that, 
and that is global democracy. We are talking about protecting democracy at the national level a lot, but I think that we, we should recognize that all these global challenges like the pandemic, climate change, um, are really challenges that affect everybody. They are global organizations that do public policy around them. And from a perspective of fairness, I think it is uh, important to say that these decisions, the global decisions that affect everybody should be made democratically as well. So it means having a community of democracies itself being democratic. And, you know, India has uh, almost twice as many people as the U European Union and the United States combined. Why shouldn't have twice as many votes uh, as them? And I know this is very revolutionary in a sense, but it's also very common sense. I believe we cannot be, uh, we cannot be pro-democracy and at the same time oppose this idea of uh, global democracy. Now, this is a huge challenge, ch sharing power. And I, I believe that's the, the challenge of, of the 21st century. And uh, to, to the, the question, the earlier question about what would um, incentivize countries like India or South Africa to join such uh, um, an organization. Again, I agree with Ash, there they, they are some self-interest that will lead them there anyway, uh, but um, they, they will want to have a real voice and a voice commensurate with the, the weight in, in, uh, in the world. And so rich countries will have to learn to share power democratically with the poorer nations. I'll leave it with that big thought. Thank you, No Powerful words to conclude on. Thank you so much, Didier. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists, Tiziana, John, Ash, Miriam, and Didier for your thoughtful contributions to today's discussion like to thank our organizers, uh, members of the Coalition for a World uh, Security Community, uh, especially Didier and his colleague, Chris Hammer, for organizing today's program. And finally, a special thanks to all of you for joining and contributing your thoughts, both in the chat function and the excellent questions posed. Sorry, I know we didn't get to get to all of them, but it shows what a rich and robust discussion this is. We do wanna conclude by wishing, of course, season's greetings this time of year. I hope that everybody will follow the big summit for democracy next week and look forward to staying in touch on these critical issues. Thank you once again. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you.